Hey, it's Dr. Cody Rawl with Tech for Psych. So what I'm doing is restarting my question to answer series because I've been getting a lot of questions on both YouTube and social media about my videos. And I think it's a good medium for me to go back and forth with the audience, not only for me to answer questions, but encourage you guys to uh, ask more questions of me. And so we can do this going forward. Uh, the first question I'm gonna take is from uh, YouTube, Jesus Rod, nice name by the way. <laughs> Jesus Rod asks, Hey Dr. Rawl, for ADHD, do you recommend Emotive Insight or Muse? I heard a lot about Emotive Epoch, but there are very few reviews about Emotive Insight. Do you have any suggestions? Okay, so for ADHD, it's pretty interesting right now. Uh, a couple of different co companies are looking into developing algorithms for ADHD. And uh, again, I don't get any financial um, rewards for talking about Muse, but I really like what they're doing. And the thing about Muse is, they have a really good neuro slash biofeedback program where you put in the earphones and you get into the meditative state and you focus on the breath and you get audio feedback to tell you whether or not you're in that sweet spot or not. And I think it's good for ADHD because really what that is doing is teaching you to have the attentional loop back to the breath. You know, you're focusing on the breath, uh, the audio feedback calms down, you're hearing like um, birds that come up. And if you're in a calm state for five seconds, you hear these birds, it's kind of like a reward and a distraction at the same time. So it teaches you to like focus on the breath. And if you haven't seen my videos on the Muse, take a look at the Mapping the Brain video and the other ones that I've done on the Muse. But um, so Muse themselves are developing algorithms more specifically for ADHD, but I think that the current bio and neurofeedback program that they have on there, the, the Muse uh, Brain Sensing Headband app that comes with the actual headband, is good for ADHD because it's teaching you how to meditate. And again, the idea there is that you're focusing on the breath and if your mind wanders, the uh, computer's gonna pick that up and you're gonna hear like crashing waves and a lot of wind and that sort of thing. So you need to redirect your mind back to the breath and that's when you hear the birds and every time you redirect your mind, you are building neuronal pathways through neuroplasticity. So you're teaching your brain to refocus back on the breath. And that's really good for ADHD because if you can imagine throughout the day when you lose attention, um, that's really what ADHD is. And you are making the long-term solution of redirecting your attention back to things that are important. So I think meditation in general and meditating with a system like the Muse is uh, good for ADHD. And like I said, I, there's a lot of different companies that are, look, that are looking at developing specific algorithms to uh, treat ADHD. There are neurofeedback clinics that have um, higher fidelity systems that specifically treat ADHD. So again, if you have uh, really bad adult ADHD, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor and get medicine for it. And I'm not saying don't go to a neurofeedback clinic and get uh, high fidelity treatment for it, but if you're looking at a personal EEG device to uh, treat ADHD symptoms, I would recommend Muse over the Emotive at this point because Emotive doesn't have like a very specific niche in terms of um, the biofeedback that Muse does. Uh, Motive is a great company and I think they are making great strides in brain computer interface, but Muse is really concentrated on that uh, clinical niche of meditation. So if you're uh, looking for something like that, I would go for the Muse right now. Okay, so for the second question, a uh, really interesting question from Braden Plain, and he asks, do you think that neuromodulation devices have a long-term effect, or are they mostly for short-term benefit? In other words, does it train the brain the way that neurofeedback does, or does it just work when used frequently? Okay, so what Braden is talking about is different neuromodulation devices. I reviewed uh, Think a couple of months ago, which is direct electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve. It's that thing that you wear on your forehead. I have a video on it, and really what's that doing is, uh, sending electrical pulses into the vagus nerve and creating an autonomic response to that. Neuromodulation is really interesting right now because there's a couple of different companies that are um, taking a look at neuromodulation and you know selling products on it. In depression, for example, they have something called transmagnetic stimulation now where you would sit in a chair and it has the sensor over you and it shoots uh, magnetic waves into your uh, prefrontal cortex and it's actually like a FDA approved treatment for depression right now. And what that's doing is stimulating the, the prefrontal cortex and it's a lot less invasive than something like ECT, you know, like when people um, talk badly about psychiatry, they usually cite that where like people are getting electric shock therapy to the brain. 
Um, it's actually a pretty intense treatment, but it really helps people get out of uh, depression sometimes. And uh, I think that what we're seeing now is the technology has evolved to the point where people can take a look at those types of methods and uh, use them more non-invasively. So Think has uh, a certain electrical stimulation that makes it so that it's more of a life, lifestyle and wellness product and they don't have to go through that FDA approval process. But uh, again, what Braden is talking about is neuromodulation like that. So what I consider is a spectrum. I think that um, things like bio and neurofeedback are more long-term benefits because you are teaching your brain, your mind to get into that meditative state. And through that process of learning, you know, you're not gonna forget that. It's going to last throughout your lifetime. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, you have something like medications where you're taking medications and only when you have the medications in your system are they really um, affecting your mental state, okay? So again, I think that there's a spectrum and I think that neuromodulation falls somewhere in between that. There's another device that has come out recently called Halo. And I think they've been pretty successful. It's like a, a headset with uh, direct electrical stimulation. And what they are advocating is that the, the stimulation during times of learning sort of opens up the neural pathways. It stimulates the nerves in order to reassimilate themselves so that you can learn certain um, things like, you know, jump higher, run faster, that sort of thing. Okay, so neuromodulation is falling somewhere in between those two. On one side of the spectrum, you have medications where, um, you know, for the most part, they're only working when you're actually taking them, and the brain is doing some neuroplasticity around that actual state. So who knows if there's some kind of like withdrawal, or, um, you know, the jury's still out on what the brain really does for medications. I'm not saying don't take medications if you're really sick and you need them, but at the same time, they're only gonna have an effect when you're actually taking them. Whereas on the other side of things, uh, neurofeedback teaches you on a long-term basis how to get into a certain mental state, whereas neuromodulation is somewhere in between. I think that it's encouraging the neurons to reshape themselves to learn how to get in certain mental states, um, but it might only last for a couple of weeks. I know with transmagnetic stimulation, they know that the effect last for a couple of weeks when they look at fMRI studies. So again, more of a spectrum between uh, you know, neurofeedback and medications. I think neuromodulation falls somewhere in between and the jury's still out on it, but it's actually a really interesting question. Okay, so for the third question, we have Cesar Buey from um, Cornell that was asking me about Alzheimer's disease research. And they're really interesting questions. And I think that this line of questioning actually pertails to a lot of questions that I was getting at Quantum University in Hawaii last week about EEG. And what we're running into are limitations of EEG, electroencephalography. Because um, you know, what Caesar was asking me was, um, what is your experience in taking care of Alzheimer's patients? And how can you incorporate personal EEG products like Muse or Emotive into caring for these patients? Part of the line of questioning was, could you diagnose Alzheimer's disease with EEG? And the answer is no. Okay, so we're coming up against the limitations of EEG right now. Again, EEG is taking a look at the, the brain waves that are coming from a person that has one of these devices on. And uh, you know, EEG has its limitations. As far as, as far as dementia goes, the pathophysiology of dementia has to do with anatomical things that are happening within the brain. So for Alzheimer's, you have beta amyloid plaques and tau tangles. And Alzheimer's disease is different from a different type of dementia like Lewy body disease or Pick's disease. These are different types of dementia that affect people as they age. And although these different neurocognitive disorders will affect the EEG signal, you couldn't actually take the EEG signal and specifically say, okay, this is uh, Alzheimer's, this is Lewy body dementia, this is Pick's disease. Because EEG, you have to, you have to remember that the, the brain waves are coming out of the brain, hitting the cerebral spinal fluid, spreading out, and you're just getting this aggregate signal, okay? Now we're trying to tease out the different nuances with machine learning and our artificial intelligence, but we're not quite there yet. So you can't actually use the MUSE to diagnose whether it would be something like Alzheimer's versus Lewy body dementia. But what you can do is tell how uh, active the brain is, okay? So there's something they teach us in medical school. There's a difference between dementia and delirium. Dementia is more of a long-term dementing process where you don't have as good memory anymore. Maybe some of the neurocognitive abilities that we all take for granted every day sort of uh, fade out and you get someone that's demented. Okay, delirium is uh, more of a short-term thing where you don't have as good of attention. So you can lose attention when you know, you're drunk or when um, you're sick. 
You know, delirium ha happens a lot in the elderly when they get a urinary tract infection or pneumonia or something like that. So that is something that doctors deal with really on a daily basis, especially if they're working at an inpatient uh, treatment facility. And what I think the EEG can be used for in terms of personal EEG devices is tracking delirium. Okay, because you will see differences in the frequency bands when it comes to delirium. You would see more delta frequency or, or theta telling that someone, okay, this person is delirious. So again, I think that the current state of EEG, you would not be able to diagnose specific states of dementia, but you can uh, tell when delirium is coming on. And that can help because there's a lot of preventative measures for delirium, you know, bringing family members in, turning on the lights, reorienting the patient to being in the hospital and being sick with a urinary tract infection or pneumonia or something like that. So I think that these personal EEG devices could be used for that. And that would be really useful for someone with uh, a neurocognitive disorder such as Alzheimer's or Pick's disease or Lewy body dementia because, as you can imagine, if your baseline is already kind of low in, certain, in terms of your neurocognitive abilities, delirium will really, you know, you're much more prone to delirium. You're much more prone to, if you're sick with a different um, ailment, such as pneumonia or, or a urinary tract infection, it's going to push you over the edge a lot easier. You're going to forget um, where you are, what your surroundings are, and it's going to bring up a lot of anxiety in those types of patients. So it was actually a really good conversation with Caesar because, you know, again, getting back to this, you can't diagnose specific uh, things like uh, different types of dementia or even different types of depression or anxiety with uh, EEG. People are working on it. People are doing quantitative EEG with high fidelity systems, but with something like Muse, you know, probably not you're going to be able to diagnose at this point in town, time, but you can track things like delirium. Okay, so that is my questions for today. Um, again, submit questions. Um, this is fun. It's kind of like a back and forth thing. So really appreciate all the questions coming in through YouTube and other social media. This is Dr. Cody Rawl with Tech for Psych. I'll talk to you again next week.